Welcome back uh, to Red Ice Radio, Richard Hoagland. It is Outer space. Mm. Coupled with that, the same physics, the same technology. If you if you you know create it properly, if you create the proper uh, technological devices, allows you to tap into an unlimited amount of so-called free energy. So you combine the energy, <clears throat> which can be in the form of electricity or you know some other very controllable um, modality that we we are familiar with. You combine that with the control of gravity, and you have the universe by the tail. I mean, there 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 there's a joke in the West, in the United States particularly, uh, which goes something like, "Where does an 800-pound gorilla sleep?" And the answer, of course, is anywhere it wants to. <laughs> well. This is the same problem we're now having with this secret hidden track of physics and technology. The people who are controlling it, <clears throat> the people who have been uh, developing it for the last, if, if, if Joseph is right, 60, 70 years, um, they're like the 800-pound gorilla. They now have the technological capability to live anywhere they want to, including any hostile, forbidden environment on any other planet in the solar system or their satellites and moons or the spaces around the, the sun in orbit. And, and we are totally, totally um, in the shadow of their capabilities. Now, Dolan has taken this idea and I think it's very appropriate, and he's looked at it from an historical point of view, which is if human beings developed in secret that kind of parallel capability, which would then get farther and farther away from what we all consider to be normal and possible, meaning civilization on Earth that we see on CNN and, you know, uh, Red Ice and Coast and Fox and, and national television mm -hmm. networks from Russia, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, what would it lead to? And what Dolan has concluded, and I agree, as does Joseph, and I guess Lavenda, and even Timothy, so we're all going to be in, in basic agreement on this point, is it would lead to what uh, Dolan has termed properly, I think, a breakaway civilization. Right. And when you try to to put numbers to this, it's very, very difficult, because I know people say, or they ask, well, how far ahead of us would they be? That's not really an appropriate question because that assumes that our historical um, database, that our historical experience of, you know, uh, for instance, let's say transportation, going from horses to carriages to horseless carriages, the first trains to diesel trains to jet aircraft, that, you know, that, that kind of trend line is going to be duplicated in, in, in these technologies, and the answer is it, it is not. Because these technologies are so godlike, and I, I use that term very precisely, because if you understand how the fundamental structure of the universe really works, and you then construct technologies that allow you to manipulate those forces directly, you have the command and control of not only energy and unlimited resources, but you also probably have, uh, have technologies that can interfere with the so-called natural biological life cycles of human beings mm -hmm. or other living creatures on Earth. And, and lifespans can be extended probably thousands or even maybe tens of thousands of years because of the ability to repair entropic breakdown of DNA and, and you know, uh, the, the ends of DNA, those I've got telomeres is what they're called, which seem to, to control our aging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this breakaway civilization, if Dolan <clears throat> and I and Joseph and Lavenda and Timothy and others are, are correct, there is almost no way to realistically calibrate how far ahead of us they are. I would say, using our crude historical rule of thumb, they could be a thousand years ahead of us by mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. even though it's only 50 years. Now, think about that. I mean, just Think about that. If you have a group of fanatic, dedicated Nazis with their perspective on the rest of human beings, humanity on Earth, where they consider most of humanity, which is not white and, and blonde-haired, to be basically a primitive inferior species, how would a civilization imbued with technological capabilities that allow them to, at some level, even move planets? Let me repeat that, mm -hmm. to actually move celestial objects. Because remember, this allows you to negate inertia and gravity and control the forces of gravity so you could set up your own orbits, et cetera, et cetera. 
if those types of capabilities are in the hands of Nazis, like we've seen in all those movies, I mean, we are in deep, deep trouble. And that is the focus of this conference, to explore the scientific evidence that, in fact, that has, in, in fact, occurred. I mean, Pharrell uh, talked about even the bailout money being tied into this. Uh, basically, mm. obviously, the, there must be a question here of how this thing is, is or was then at least funded. I mean, if they're so advanced at this point, they could probably go out there, get whatever resource they would want, gold, diamonds, oil, what have you, uh, things we don't even might know about at this point. But... Uh, how do you think that well, this let thing me, let me started? Stop you there, yeah, <clears throat> cause I think you raised a really important point. Um, I, 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 I presume you have watched Star Trek, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Gene Roddenberry, my dear departed friend, created this amazing vision of a human race living and working together and encountering alien species and living and working together with them in the so-called Federation of Planets, Right. And from time to time, they will have scripts or story arcs where uh, people who are still primitive like us, meaning that they are dealing with limited resources, limited energy, limited environment, living space, etc., encounter representatives of the Federation. And it was Gene's great pride to talk about how, at that point in time, we will have bypassed the concept of money, of possession of big stuff. Not, not personal stuff, but big stuff. And the reason is just what you said. If you can tap the real forces of the universe, if you can uh, provide access through some technological means to unlimited pollutionless energy in whatever form you desire, be it coherent, like electricity, radio technology, radio waves, lasers, whatever, or incoherent, like heat, just to keep yourself warm, and that allows you then to manipulate the resources of an entire solar system or, and this is probably going to raise some eyebrows, to create matter out of nothing, out of empty space itself, out of the ether, which I have seen experiments that demonstrate that that's possible with this physics, then you don't need money. You don't need the kind of primitive economy that we are dealing with. But reversing your question, who in that larger picture would still need money and a lot of it if they in fact are looking forward to some um, cataclysmic shall we say change in the planet here itself mm -hmm. in the foreseeable future obviously the terrestrial representatives of this breakaway civilization here on earth still kept still trapped still here with within our civilization and amongst us. And if you wanted to identify a class of people that that would describe, I think I'm describing the banksters. Mm -hmm. I think describing the people who run the world because they do control the money of our primitive economy and society. And so all these trillions of dollars that are going into some black hole because it's certainly not going into what it's being purported that they were being uh, you know, taken from taxpayers to be used for. I think that is a, um, a, a stash or a secret fund or a, a, a basically pirate treasure that these rip-off artists are, are taking from the rest of us so they can somehow carve out their own separate civilization when push comes to shove and these other guys decide that they no longer need six billion of us on planet Earth and that time appears to be approaching from the circumstantial evidence we're seeing given the rate at which things are accelerating in the financial markets in terms of global geology in terms of very bizarre are anomalies taking place around the Earth. So I think not only are we looking at a secret space program, but we're probably looking now at a secret space war being fought between those on Earth who are trying to maintain their position and those out there who have finally decided that if, 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 if we continue along our present track, we will become a competition for them and they cannot uh, allow that. They cannot, you know, afford to have that happen. And so they are taking steps to basically quarantine us here on Earth. And I believe that the evidence will support that they are using this extraordinary technology for some demonstrations of the awful power they possess 
in terms of blackmailing mm -hmm. governments on this planet to do their bidding to stay home and not become competitors. See, it's a very interesting point. I, I want to, uh, you know, ask you about the representatives here as well. I mean, the, the, the Nazis always comes up as as the arch villain. It seems like, and I don't think a lot of people would agree that many of the banksters that you mentioned are kind of Aryan Germans at this point. If the if oh, this, hi, hang on, yeah, we 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 know from uh, Lavender's work, we know from Dolan, we know from Joseph Farrell, that in fact the banksters bankroll the Nazis. They created the Nazis. They, 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 you know, during the 20s and 30s and, and 40s, they were the ones who were totally behind them. What I think we might be seeing is an expression from an old movie now, when thieves fall out. Because what they, I, I, I believe what they did not understand is that they were pawns too. They yes. thought they were the masters of the universe. And they've now found out, to their extraordinary shock and surprise, that there is much victims and in prison here. I mean, we, we have a, an American author, I don't know whether you ever had him on your show, his name is Alex Jones, and he runs a website called PrisonPlanet.com. Sure. I think Alex Jones has absolutely got it correct. We are on, if this model is accurate, a prison planet, and someone now is trying to keep us from breaking out. Uh, but who, again, if we go back to this idea, and this is the difficult part here, who is the elite and also what the, is the ideology behind them? Because I believe, uh, just as you said, I think that the, the Nazis were set up in order to fulfill the, the, uh, the agenda of somebody much higher, if you will, upon this uh, hierarchy, on this ladder of, of, uh, of things. So what if we go into this aspect of talking about some of the motives here? Uh, and, and the philosophy that is, that is driving this? I mean, if it was, if it's only and solely was a, was a Nazi agenda... Um, then at this point, if the if the point here was to eradicate as many people as possible, uh, why wouldn't have they have done so already? Uh, if we look at it from that point of view, uh, and, and if it's not Nazis at the ultimate, uh, you know, t tip of this pyramid, uh, who who is doing this, uh, Richard? Who's behind it? Well, you have to again back off and look at this from from a big perspective. Again, in the timeline that Farrell and Lavenda and Dolan and I are looking at. We're looking at the events from World War II leading to a breakaway group of Nazis with this control of technology and physics, able to live anywhere they want to. But it's a relatively tiny group of people to start with. Mm -hmm. oh, you can live anywhere you want to, but is anywhere you want to as nice as Earth? Remember, in the entire solar system, the only planet where you can walk on beaches and look at sunsets and admire aurora and basically live as, you know, we have been living for thousands of years without technology is here. So even if you command these extraordinary forces, you cannot remake entire planets within let's say 60 years so earth is still the place that you probably want to if not live at least vacation and to do that you need the accommodation of various governments so that you have some kind of modus vivendi where you leave them alone and they leave you alone i mean six billion people working day and night produce a lot of stuff that whoever is running the show even from off planet could probably benefit from it's not so much that the Nazis were out to exterminate everybody. They were out to exterminate certain competing groups, remember, like the Masons, who right. had the same occult ideas that the, uh, the Nazis did. And, of course, they were competitors, so they had to be eliminated. Uh, the same way with the uh, Jews. They were another group of competing peoples. Because if you look back in, in Jewish tradition, particularly the work of uh, Stan Tennant at the Meru Foundation, you'll find the roots of this physics in uh, Hebrew uh, documentation extending back all the way through the Torah. The keys to this physics are in some of the most ancient sacred documents on planet Earth. Hmm. And it turns out that those are the peoples that the Nazis targeted for extinction, for extermination. Because if you eliminate the people in terms of, let's say, uh, the uh, Jewish faith, you eliminate the carrier wave of the very physics that allows you to control them. So again, it was about eliminating competition. 
Um, ultimately, I don't believe that, that this group is out to destroy six billion people on the Earth. I think you're going to let nature try to do that because the physics of the planet itself is changing in a cyclic pattern. And we can see that in various records, like from the U.S. Geological Survey, which shows us that earthquakes and volcanoes and major geological disturbances have been on a monotonic increase for the last several decades. Well, our physics model predicts in fact, when you look at the solar system, when you look at NASA data, you see planetary changes all over the solar system, which I think are part of a huge natural cycle of this physics, which has to do with alignment, where planets are relative to the center of the galaxy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at very long time cycles, kind of appropriate to the Indian Vedas. Do you know much about the Indian Vedas? We've talked about them on the program many times, so I think our audience is well versed in that too, uh, Richard, yes. So we're looking at the Yuga Cycles. Well, the Yuga Cycles in our model is driven by these long-scale changes in the background physics. But what I believe is happening now is we're coming up to one of those nodal points so that we can actually look at um, people politically anticipating what would be done in case the physics um, were to take care of, let's say, the... The, the terrestrial problem all by itself with no, with no um, intercession by outside agencies. So uh, this is not a simple subject to deal with, and we're dealing sure. with very limited evidence because we don't have their playbook. We don't have access. We don't have spies inside the other camp. We're, we're basically like the old joke about the, you know, the, the five Indian guys, all blind or blindfolded, who are kind of all gathered around an elephant and they're trying to describe what the elephant is really like based on each one's individual perception. Yeah. So they want Earth for their vacation resorts of sorts and and there are too many people on the planet from their point of view and the planet are, is, is, is messy it's dirty uh, well, so all right it, I'll stop there because you have another, another you reach another interesting point mm -hmm. because they have to limit us to these primitive stupid technologies the more of us there are here the dirtier the earth is going to get right right would you, if you were, let's say, the, the, the let, well, let's use analogies where people are familiar. We have a rich elite on Earth, a jet set around the world. They show up at Monte Carlo. They, they visit and live in the uh, Mexican Riviera, and they're watching pollution creeping in and despoiling their beaches, their waters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you had the capability of, of reducing the, the uh, environmental impact of the population you have deliberately kept down on the farm, deliberately kept under a lid, so they don't have pollutionless technologies, they don't have free energy, mm. then obviously the only way you can, can go is to limit the number of people that are going to be on that planet, which is your kind of vacation spot. And so there is a, a rationale, as awful and immoral and as bizarre as it may seem, to ultimately look to see if there are ways to reduce the population to where there is just a kind of a caretaker population on Earth and you get to live anywhere you want to and if you want a nice open skies, you know, sunsets and, and broad seas, you can come to Earth because it will now be pristine once again. That makes a kind of a rationale for why they would want to eliminate so many workers here because, frankly, they don't need them. Well, and that would also make sense from the point of view then that the, this incredibly well-funded green movement that we see on the rise right now is trying to tell, turn us all into Luddites as well because we're not getting access to the real clean energy, free energy, anti-gravity that you mentioned before. So we're kind of going backwards as well on the, on the, on the surface here, if you know what I mean, Richard. Well, you, again, this, this follows the model exactly because if, if, if they have to keep some of us around for like maintenance staff, okay, serfs, slaves, whatever you want to call them, uh, because bodies, remember, are a lot cheaper than technology. Yeah. Even in a, in a world where you don't price things, it is so much easier to tell a human being what to do than to tell a robot what to do, because robots, even the best of them, break down. Hmm. Yeah, it's true, it's true. So wh what are we looking at here in terms of, uh, I mean, for, again, if we, if we look, examine this logically, rationally, uh, if they are behind some of the uh, the major catastrophes that are happening on the planet right now, Richard, uh, oil spill, uh, nuclear meltdown here at the facilities, if, me, if that's what they are, how, how does that play into this? Because that makes it even more dirty, right? What's going on? Well, remember, it's only a short term. They are thinking long term. Transitions are messy. 
you have to get from here to there, right? And if, if going back to what I said earlier, this physics, this technology allows you to extend human lifespans to extraordinary levels, where is the last time we read in, in actual documents that human beings lived, you know, a thousand years? Probably the Bible, I guess, huh? Precisely. And where is that derived from? What culture? What population? The uh, I would say the Essenes, but the the Hebrews, I guess, or the Hyksos, if you look at some of the other people out there, yeah. Exactly. So if if they have now been able to regenerate that that ancient knowledge to where they can live a thousand years productively, then they can afford to take the long view. Let's say it takes a hundred years to totally transition from the population on the earth we have now to where it's down to where they are happy and the earth is returned to somewhat like the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Well, a hundred years, if you live a thousand years, is one-tenth of your lifespan. That's for a a, a human being now. uh, If you live 60, 70 years, that's like six years. (laughs) So even uh, oh, even nuclear uh, radiation is is no big here, or maybe they even have cleanup well, technologies remember, that we don't know about. Well, remember the nuclear radiation can be ameliorated with this technology, so it goes away in in hours. How do I know that? Because some years ago on Good Morning America, some friends of mine demonstrated a pebble bed cold fusion technology that in twenty minutes reduced by half the radiation on live television uh, in, a, in a beaker uh, that, that has a half-life of four and a half billion years. Let me repeat that. Mm. Uranium breakdown takes four and a half billion years to get rid of half the uranium which is fissioning. They were able to demonstrate um, from cold fusion technologies on Good Morning America years ago on live television the ability to break down that nuclear waste in 20 minutes and not have to wait four and a half billion years for it to go way by half. So those technologies, again, could be used to ameliorate what's going on in Japan right now. They could have been used at Three Mile Island. They certainly could have been used at Chernobyl, and they were not. Because if we had access to those technologies, we get access to the whole ball of wax, as we say over here, and then we become their equals, and they cannot allow that. Ergo, we are being kept down on the farm in this transition until we can be moved aside for their plan for the future of their version of humanity. I mean, this is very scary and awesome stuff, and if I didn't have some good news at the end of this, I wouldn't even be talking like this. (laughs) What is, uh, what is some of the good news, uh, Richard? Well, the good news is that unbeknownst to them, the banksters quietly took their knowledge and, and developed in secret laboratories, black ops, weapons labs and whatever, equivalent technologies and physics, and that's why we're at war, because our guys, the guys that run us on Earth, the banksters, in fact, and you can call them the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds, you know, those cliched names, but they, in fact, are now at war with these guys out there, and that's why you're seeing, in our model, all the bizarre things going on around the planet, because we're in a secret war where none of the protagonists want the slaves, meaning all the rest of us, to know we're at war for the first time in history. We're in a war that we're not supposed to know about. And all we're hearing is like, it's like you're in the jungle in the middle of the night, right? And you're gathered around your little fire and you're, you know, uh, roasting your, your, your roast pig over the, the, the spit or something. And you hear these big booms and thumping around in the darkness. And you have no idea what's out there. You just know that you don't want to get involved with it because it's a lot bigger than you are and probably a lot nastier and you wouldn't come off very well. Well, the human race is like that. We're seeing all these weird things going going on, they're being covered on the news as one thing, when in fact they're merely the the tip of the iceberg in terms of the secret conflict, the secret competition going on between the guys who would be our masters and the guys who are their masters, and they're fighting it out, and we're not supposed to know, which is why there have been no horrific cities decimated or millions of people killed in one instant. The closest we came, I think, to that kind of awful horror was the earthquake in uh, Haiti, Mm -hmm. which in an instant, you know, a few minutes, killed 200,000 people just days after the appearance of this incredible Norway spiral 
up over the northern climbs of Russia and Sweden and Finland, which was a signal just before President Obama was to receive his Nobel Prize that, in fact, he was to do their bidding and not what his own agenda might be, whatever that is. And I think we can see modern history reaching a major turning point on the morning of December 9th, 2009, when that spiral appeared over the northern polar regions of Norway and Sweden and Russia and Finland, and things dramatically changed after that. The uh, tsunami in, in Japan here, um, many people are speculating uh, now, obviously, as they always do after some kind of catastrophe, that there is uh, advanced technology involved. involved. Uh, HARP obviously always comes up in this one. Uh, I've been looking at the sun, though, two X-class flares uh, very shortly before that. Right now, currently, as we speak, we have a so-called super moon happening, uh, and we could even be looking at more earthquakes and other interesting events happening as well. Could Could it be that they are also utilizing certain natural energies because of uh, you know your solar, solar flares and and, and uh, these incredible uh, proximities of, of uh, the moon to the earth or is it is it a technology altogether is is, is the heart behind the tsunami in japan do you think uh, richard well the honest answer is i don't know i'm looking at data it's very hard to come by but one of the things that really is intriguing to me is why the, the Japanese government, which is a very sophisticated government, I mean, Japan has been with us for hundreds, if not thousands of years in one form or another, right? And they live on an island which is constantly beset by earthquakes, right? Yeah. yeah. How could they have been caught so flat-footed, again, an expression we use over here, and be reacting in such a, frankly, unprofessional manner? I don't understand um, it either. It's very strange. Unless... They are encountering forces and indicators that are baffling to them, or they are under some kind of constraints that you will allow this catastrophe to unfold because it needs to make a major impression on decision makers and policy makers on this planet that if you don't do exactly what we say, we will eliminate you, we will destroy you, and this is our demonstration of our capability to do exactly what we say. Uh, there was a, an Israeli security firm actually in charge of the Japanese nuclear facility prior to the disaster, a year and a half ago before or something like that. They put in a, a safety system and things like that. I'm not saying that they are solely responsible for this, uh, but uh, you know, who, who, who do you think would allow, if anything, a, a disaster like this to, to happen if, that was a, if this was meant to happen in that sense? Or again, are we looking at a, a fluke kind of situation where, where one thing just unfolded after the other? But just as you said, Richard, why wouldn't they be uh, prepared or have uh, better equipment uh, in, in place? It's, uh, it's an earthquake-rich uh, you know, country, a zone. Well, what, what's even more baffling is people say, oh, the Japanese are independent and reliant. Well, they're not. The Japanese are very dependent on each other, and they live on a very tiny island. They import 100% of their oil. They have no oil. 30% of their energy needs are met by nuclear power, but this is very old nuclear power. I mean, these plants were, were built by GE back in the 60s. They're like Mark I. They're the first generation yeah. of, of nuclear reactors that were deployed commercially on this planet. And the idea that they wouldn't, when they, when they, to even anticipate, given that they can look at the statistics just like we can and see the rising number of earthquakes. Have you looked at any, any USG charts over the last month or two at how many earthquakes, big earthquakes we've had in the Pacific mm -hmm. in the last uh, year? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's an extraordinary number. I mean, 6.0 earthquakes now are routine in the Pacific. It never used to be like that. So you have this rising background of nature. Remember, these are natural cycles. Under that cover of a natural background, you can hide all kinds of mischief and pass it off as just an accident due to the forces of nature. You know, that you can't, you can't box with God is, is another expression one could use. Hmm. But I'm finding the post-catastrophe reactions so bizarre because they don't match the people who I know have the expertise and the organizational talent to if they don't have, you know, necessary resources at home, they call on help. We live now in an international climate where when you have a disaster, the whole world pitches in and helps, right? Yeah. That has not happened in Japan. Why not? Yeah.
I think it's because somebody's been told, don't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, uh, look, I am grasping, like everyone else, at some kind of rational explanation for the irrational. Yeah. Why would you build a nuclear plant in an earthquake zone at the edge of the ocean, on a, on a, on, on, basically on the shore, with a lousy 25-foot high wall to prevent a tsunami from sweeping you back into the ocean when you know you live in a, a place for thousands of years that has had earthquakes. And if you look at the USGS data or your own geological scientific people, you can see that major earthquakes have been increasing for decades, monotonically, very predictably, and it's only a matter of time until a big one hits close to you and you have a huge tsunami roll ashore and do exactly what what was done. Yeah. This is not rocket science. This is not magic. This is so predictable, and yet they've done nothing. Have yeah. they done nothing to prevent it as they were told to do nothing? They, they've been uh, even making it worse because the Fukushima plant had actually kept over, I think, over 40 years of spent nuclear rods underneath the plant. So I think over, I think someone mentioned a number of about 600,000 spent fuel rods might potentially be uh, you know radiating out as we speak because again we c they barely can get close to these uh, damaged reactors i think four in total now have been damaged so we have no well, idea how much is get getting out there richard what's interesting is we're not given accurate numbers we don't have an accurate survey we don't even have cutaway drawings of what the plant looks like we don't have you know in, in independent readings of the radiation we are we are literally living in a controlled disaster unfolding and that's not even counting the horrors of the earthquake which has killed untold thousands of people and then the tsunami which drowned those that managed to survive i mean this is this is a three uh triple whammy and it's not being responded to in the way that other disasters have been responded to in, in the past and I think, again, this is nearly a speculation because I don't have hard data yet, but it fits to, to me the, the model that, yes, we're involved in a secret space war between humanity here on Earth and whoever our masters are out there who have evolved off Earth, as Dolan says, in the last 60 years into this stunning breakaway civilization, and we are being basically blackmailed into staying here and minding our P's and Q's and doing exactly what they say. And if anybody gets out of line, they can use this as an example of, see, this is what we will do to you, and it's only a tenth of thousands of what we can do, so you don't question. It's uh, it's very strange, again, just what you the, the point you bring up uh, about how uh, either other, you know, the international community is prevented from from helping out here in, in Japan in one sense or another. I mean, look at how quickly they were uh, ready and and uh, willing to intervene in the internal affairs of Libya. Now that wasn't any problem, uh, but here in in Japan, where there is potentially the the entire population of you know the northern hemisphere is at at risk. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Well, I have heard numbers quoted something like seventeen hundred metric tons of radioactive rods, uh, you know, nuclear fuel rods that are stored in these ponds uh, waiting for when they can be transported to some kind of permanent storage off-site. And because these reactors were the first generation of nuclear reactors that General Electric built back in the 60s and 70s, they have to store those rods on-site in a swimming pool and they put them on the upper floors of the same buildings that are built around the reactors. Yeah. So if, if a catastrophe comes along and wipes out your reactor, it also wipes out your capabilities to keep those, those spent fuel rods cool, as we are seeing. I mean, this is like a perfectly scripted disaster. Perfectly scripted. It's, it's awesome to watch. It's painful to watch. And the only ray of hope that I think I can offer is that I think our guys have some secret technology that they are now using to ameliorate it because by my calculations, we all should be living now under the same kind of disaster as we had at Chernobyl. And the fact that we're not, the fact that even specialists are saying on network television, there are things going on here that we can't understand, it, it, it's not going the way we would think, tells me that maybe we are actually quietly using some secret technology to ameliorate the radioactivity because we are not going to go peacefully as our masters want us to. We are fighting back. Yeah. But no one is allowed to know that we're fighting back. 
which of course is what we're going to be discussing at the conference in detail in a couple weeks in Amsterdam at this very important uh, secret space program conference. It's a very beautiful venue, very modern, very, very, you know, it's got excellent audio visual. We're going to be presenting some pretty amazing images. And uh, I, I, I'm really thinking that this conference could become a watershed to where we coherently draw attention to the real problems of, of you know, as we approach 2012. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you obviously have been detailing uh, many, you know, fascinating aspects in terms of the extraterrestrial in some cases as far as we know uh, you know artifacts in in our solar system possibly beyond as well in this particular situation uh when we have these different factions fighting a, a human possibly them branch as well that is uh, off world already out there in space are we alone in this situation do, do you think that there's others out there richard w watching and what is unfolding and happening here at the moment now that makes for a very important question is it just us and them, or are there other players on the stage? And my provisional answer is, yes, there are other players. I don't know how deeply they're involved. I have some suspicions. I will be laying those out with the marginal evidence we have to support those positions at the conference. Um, but there is so much uncertainty. I mean, this whole uh, topic of discussion is shrouded in the same kind of ambiguity and mystery that the, the, the problems that uh, the Fukushima plant seem to be surrounded by. It's like we, sh we should know more, and we don't, and then the question is, why don't we? Well, obviously, because some people don't want us to know. And if they don't want us to know, it says to me there are things behind the scenes, political things, that they really don't want us to know, and that's why they're trying to keep us in the dark. Hmm. And how much do you think that this other, uh, this breakaway civilization have uncovered in terms of this? I mean, could it be also that th at this, this point that they have found certain things out there which have also caught their attention enough to set up a, a, another program, another project in order to try to detail some of the things that have been happening probably millions and millions of years ago in our own solar system, uh, Richard? I, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, remember, if we go back to the, the, the picture of the 800-pound gorilla, if they have had the capability of true space flight, meaning anti-gravity, not, not stupid things like rockets, the shuttle, Saturn V, whatever, if they've had true anti-gravity for 60 years, then obviously if they went to the moon, there are stunning technological secrets and physics secrets to be found and gained there, if only because there will be libraries, and they will be translatable libraries, because you know, the language of science and physics is all the same. No matter where you are in the universe, it's the same physics. So once you get access to those ancient records from a solar system civilization that I believe is equivalent to Kardashev's famed uh, Type II uh, civilization in his three classes. Remember how the Russian astrophysicist Kardashev um, coined the, the phrase Type I, Type II, Type III? Mm -hmm. Uh, one civilization controls the energy of its planet. A type two controls the energy of its star, meaning its entire solar system. And a type three would control the energies of an entire galaxy. Well, if you have that capability in the hands of primitive Nazis, I mean, God help us. Because by going out into the solar system, they will have had the ability to pick and choose the best of what was left after the cataclysmic effects of millions of years ago, which led to the destruction of this much larger, much more ancient civilization, again, as we have looked at the data and have tried to put the pieces back together. And that, of course, puts them, as I said, roughly maybe a thousand years ahead of where we are now in terms of capability and accelerating. Mm. So, yeah, I think we are facing a absolute breakpoint in civilization. I think this conference is perfectly timed and again the good news is we are not totally defenseless because the banksters to their credit because they were obviously concerned about being double crossed at some point as well appear to have developed a whole bunch of toys that are now being used to confront these guys and to essentially produce some kind of stalemate or standoff otherwise you and I would not be having this conversation and it's that unknown, untabulated, undeclared war that we have to explore with all our resources, 
all of us independent researchers and scientists and policy people in an effort to change the course of history and in fact reassert a human being's right to live here on planet earth undisturbed and uh, and unwitting public um, th there's a reason why they keep it on on that level i mean uh, there's a lot of people here and and, and again that uh, it's a lot of um uh, you know manpower force and and uh, and in, if you want to look at it that way military or or, or you know personnel uh, they can't help in any way, in any way. They, they would that just make the situation worse do you think if this in some way was announced or, or publicly you know declared declared somebody put the the cards on the table here and t told it like it is did you ever read the world the works of charles fort no i haven't actually Are you familiar with his works? Some of Even it. By type? Some of it, yeah. Okay. Back in, I think it was the 30s or 40s, he wrote a book called The Book of the Damned, which I thought was a very peculiar title. I think Charles Fort understood what we've been discussing now because he basically makes the statement in that book, we are property. The only way he could explain the anomalies he saw even in those early decades of the 20th century was to come to the conclusion that we are property of someone who has much more muscle and much more capability than human beings currently have. If that's true, then whoever wins this secret war wants us to remain property. And the one thing that would change that equation is if human beings realized they were property. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to keep us from knowing. And that's our job is to is to promulgate this far and wide with the evidence so, in fact, human beings can reassert their natural heritage to this planet and take back control of their lives. And it's not undoable. It's just going to be very hard. And for a lot of people, it's going to be a terrible shock to find out that most of which they've been taught for their entire lives is absolutely flat-ass wrong, if I can say that on radio. You definitely can. Uh, no worries about that, Richard. Is there a timeline here as well uh, th that is being uh, kept? Because some, in some cases, I'm surprised that certain things haven't unfolded, uh, if I put it that way. Uh, and, and again, how how bad do you think things are if we look at these the cataclysm cataclysmic cycle that you mentioned before, natural disasters and so forth as well? Is is this going to increase now? Then, and is that does that play into this idea of of uh, a timeline being kept here, uh, Richard? Um, I believe so. I think I think for for a kind of useful rule of thumb for the model, we can say that this is all pegged to 2012. That that the, the clock is ticking down to 2012 because that's when some major geophysical problem could occur on Earth that would quietly eliminate most of their their population problem. And by not alerting the appropriate authorities or giving them on Earth the appropriate technology to deal with that physics they can basically wash their hands and say, look, it wasn't us, it was just nature, and they were too damn dumb and stupid to figure it out in time to save themselves. Right. In other words, it's a very clever head game. Now, why would that kind of a game need to go on? That raises the question, is there a larger civilization out there in the galaxy watching, seeing who is going to do what, Who is going to win? And is there some kind of prime directive in operation, a la my friend Gene, where they cannot intervene directly, but if we ask for help, if we, if we understand that we're not alone, if we take certain measures to assert that new knowledge, they in fact are then allowed to intervene and, and help us, you know, keep these, these beasts at bay. Um, our vice president yesterday made a very interesting, uh, Uh, case. He actually used a term that I have not heard for a long time. He talked about barbarians at the gate, and everyone thought he was talking in a certain direction about events occurring politically here in the United States. I'm wondering if, in fact, he was talking to a, another audience about a different set of barbarians who, in fact, are at the gates unless we take drastic action and uh, become very much more self-aware. are so godlike, and I, I use that term very precisely, because if you understand how the fundamental structure of the universe really works, and you then construct technologies that allow you to manipulate those forces directly, 
you have the command and control of not only energy and unlimited resources, but you also probably have, uh, have technologies that can interfere with the so-called natural biological life cycles of human beings or other living creatures on Earth. And, and lifespans can be extended probably thousands or even maybe tens of thousands of years because of the ability to repair entropic breakdown of DNA and, and you know, uh, the, the, the ends of DNA, those I've got telomeres is what they're called, which seem to, to control our aging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this breakaway civilization, if Dolan <clears throat> and I and Joseph and Lavenda and Timothy and others are, are correct, there is almost no way to realistically calibrate how far ahead of us they are. I would say, using our crude historical rule of thumb, they could be a thousand years ahead of us by now, mm -hmm. even though it's only 50 years. Now, think about that. I mean, just think about that. If you have a group of fanatic, dedicated Nazis with their perspective on the rest of human beings, humanity on Earth, where they consider most of humanity, which is not white and, and blonde-haired, to be basically a primitive inferior species, the, the sun in orbit, and, and we are totally, totally um, in the shadow of their capabilities. Now, Dolan has taken this idea and I think it's very appropriate, and he's looked at it from an historical point of view, which is if human beings developed in secret that kind of parallel capability, which would then get farther and farther away from what we all consider to be normal and possible, meaning civilization on Earth that we see on CNN and, you know, uh, Red Ice and Coast and Fox and, and national television mm -hmm. networks from Russia, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, what would it lead to? And what Dolan has concluded, and I agree, as does Joseph, and I guess Lavenda, and even Timothy, so we're all going to be in, in basic agreement on this point, is it would lead to what uh, Dolan has termed properly, I think, a breakaway civilization. Right. And when you try to to put numbers to this, it's very, very difficult, because I know people say, or they ask, well, how far ahead of us would they be? That's not really an appropriate question because that assumes that our historical um, database, that our historical experience of, you know, uh, for instance, let's say transportation, going from horses to carriages to horseless carriages, the first trains to diesel trains to jet aircraft, that, you know, that that kind of trend line is going to be duplicated in 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 these technologies, and the answer is it, it is not. Because these technologies, how would a civilization imbued with technological capabilities that allow them to, at some level, even move planets, let me repeat that, mm -hmm. to actually move celestial objects? Because remember, this allows you to negate inertia and gravity and control the forces of gravity so you could set up your own orbits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. If those types of capabilities are in the hands of Nazis, like we've seen in all those movies, I mean, we are in deep, deep trouble, and that is the focus of this conference, to explore the scientific evidence that, in fact, that has, in, in fact, occurred. I mean, Pharrell uh, talked about even the bailout money being tied into this. Uh, basically, <clears throat> obviously, the, there must be a question here of how this thing is, is or was then at least funded. I mean, if they're so advanced at this point, they could probably go out there, get whatever resource they would want, gold, diamonds, oil, what have you, uh, things we don't even might know about at this point. But uh, how do you think that well, this thing me, was started? Well, let me there, because yeah, I think you raised a really important point. Um I, I, I presume you have watched Star Trek, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Gene Roddenberry, my dear departed friend, created this amazing vision of a human race living and working together and encountering alien species and living and working together with them in the so-called Federation of Planets, right? And from time to time, they will have scripts or story arcs where uh, people who are still primitive like us, meaning that they... Welcome back uh, to Red Ice Radio, Richard Hoagland. It is Outer space. Mm. Coupled with that, the same physics, the same technology. If you if you you know create it properly, if you 
create the proper uh, technological devices allows you to tap into an unlimited amount of so-called free energy. So you combine the energy, <clears throat> which can be in the form of electricity or you know some other very controllable um, modality that we we are familiar with. You combine that with the control of gravity, and you have the universe by the tail. I mean, there 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 there's a joke in the West, in the United States particularly, uh, which goes something like, "Where does an 800-pound gorilla sleep?" And the answer, of course, is anywhere it wants to. <laughs> well. This is the same problem we're now having with this secret hidden track of physics and technology. The people who are controlling it, <clears throat> the people who have been uh, developing it for the last, if, if, if Joseph is right, 60, 70 years, um, they're like the 800-pound gorilla. They now have the technological capability to live anywhere they want to, including any hostile, forbidden environment on any other planet in the solar system, or their satellites and moons, or the spaces around the sea are dealing with limited resources, limited energy, limited environment, living space, etc. Encounter representatives of the Federation, and it was Gene's great pride to talk about how at that point in time, we will have bypassed the concept of money, of possession, of big stuff. Not, not personal stuff, but big stuff. And the reason is just what you said. If you can tap the real forces of the universe, if you can uh, provide access through some technological means to unlimited pollutionless energy in whatever form you desire, be it coherent, like electricity, radio technology, radio waves, lasers, whatever, or incoherent, like heat, just to keep yourself warm. And that allows you then to manipulate the resources of an entire solar system, or, and this is probably going to raise some eyebrows, to create matter out of nothing, out of empty space itself, out of the ether, which I have seen experiments that demonstrate that that's possible with this physics, then you don't need money. You don't need the kind of primitive economy that we are dealing with. But reversing your question, who in that larger picture would still need money, and a lot of it, if they in fact are looking forward to some um, cataclysmic, shall we say, change in the planet here itself mm -hmm. in the foreseeable future? Obviously, the...